Um, but what we're first going to do is something a little bit intense. So you guys just need to stay with me, okay? Just for the next 20 minutes. Please just hold on, okay? It's going to be a little bit mathy. What we're going to do now is we're going to derive something called the discrete time Fourier transform, okay? And the discrete time Fourier transform is just the normal Fourier transform, but for discrete signals, okay? So we're going to derive like a special form of the Fourier transform for discrete signals, signals that look like this. And the reason we're going to do this is that we are going to need this thing, the discrete time Fourier transform. We need that thing in order to get to the discrete Fourier transform. We've learned about the Fourier transform. That's in your continuous, um, continuous signal processing course. The Fourier transform is nice. It allows us to manipulate signals, but it has this irritating integral thing, which um, pains me, and it means I can't calculate it on a computer for arbitrary signals. So where I want to end up is something called the discrete Fourier transform. The discrete Fourier transform is nice. It will be our friend for this whole course. Um, we're going to figure out how to do it fast and efficiently. And the DFT is super cool because I call a Python function and I can get the Fourier uh, an approximate Fourier transform for any signal. Boom, a discrete signal. To get there, we're going to do this little intermediate um, transform called the discrete time Fourier transform. Okay? The discrete time Fourier transform is exactly the Fourier transform, but for discrete signals. No approximations, it's exactly the same thing. It's just a special version of the Fourier transform when we have a discrete signal. The DFT is not exact. We will see that. The DFT messes things up in a number of ways, which then gives me the benefit of being able to calculate it in Python or on a CPU or in a microcontroller. Okay? But it messes up. The discrete time Fourier transform doesn't mess up. And the discrete time Fourier transform is really nothing else than the slide. It's really just basically going to get the Fourier, an expression for the Fourier transform here, um, which is actually this picture here. So what we really want is we are going to get a sampled signal, XS, a sampled signal, which we first just think of as in the time domain. Later on, we will remove time basically from this whole thing. The sampled signal, XS, is just equal to my original signal times my impulse train, ST, that we saw on the previous slide. So XT times ST gives my, me my sampled signal here. XT just stays XT, and now what I will do is I will just write out that impulse train. So the impulse train is a sum of a whole bunch of impulses. An impulse at minus 2T, minus T, 0, T, 2T, 3T, and so on. And mathematically, I can write that down as the sum from minus infinity, infinity, of this Dirac delta function, my impulse, in T. What I can do now is... I can actually take this signal in here into the summation, but then I don't have to keep every single continuous time point. I only have to keep the signal at the points where the Dirac delta happens. So this is equal to x nt times Dirac delta t minus nt. If this surprises you, that's good. Go and make sure this evening, sit in the bath and just think about that little step. Glass of red wine or castle light or whatever, swirl it and then make sure you, you get that step. Okay, so what we want is the discrete time Fourier transform is really, it will start as the Fourier transform of this thing. So it's really just the Fourier transform of X, S, T. The Fourier transform of that thing is uh, the integration minus infinity, inf infinity, X, S, T times complex exponential, minus j2 pi ft and then I can never remember if it's dt or df but I know this function should be a function of f so I know I can't integrate out f so this should be dt okay cool and now what we do is we're just going to take this thing and plug it in like that thing there and plug it in to that thing there next step what we're going to do is here we've got an integration, here we've got a summation. We're going to flip the two, okay? And I'm allowed to do that, why? 
because I always think of integration a little bit like a very fine grade sum, which it is, okay? And the sum of a sum is the same as the sum of the sum. The sum of the sum is the same as the sum of the sum. Okay, so I can flip the two. As long as the things that I'm summing over stays on the right side, okay? I can't take things out of a sum that I'm summing over. That didn't make any sense, but okay. So what I'm doing is minus infinity to infinity. I can take this thing out as long as my integration is over little t. This thing doesn't have a little t, so I can take that out. That's what I meant with taking out the right stuff. So I'm taking that out. And then I have integration minus infinity to infinity. And you will in a second see that engineers hate integration. So we do everything that we can to avoid doing a proper integral. Okay? And that's why we reorder things here. Because the integral of... Okay, this looks like a scary integral. But you guys know that integrating over a Dirac delta is fun. Because you don't have to do anything. You just see where it fires, and it fires at nt, and then you stick nt into that thing, and that's the result of the, the integration if, you have, if you're integrating at Dirac delta multiplied with some signal. Um, what's that property called? Can you remember? Shifting property, spot on. Okay. So that whole thing actually reduces to minus infinity, infinity, x, nt times, and then everywhere where there's a t here which is there um, we're going to just replace that with nt okay that's what the sifting property does so we get e to the minus j 2 pi f i'm happy i have my f because i know this is a function of f okay so i didn't screw up n t okay and we're actually almost done we we can still simplify this a little bit and the way we're going to simplify it is we're going to define a new variable here. And we will call that f omega. Okay, and f omega is this pretty cool thing. I'm going to define it. So we define it as ft. Okay. This is pretty weird, but it will become clear in a second why we're doing this. And that's also just equal to f over fs. I can already tell you what's happening here, and it won't make sense the first time I say it. But what we're doing here, we're normalizing out the sample frequency. If I give you like a discrete sampled signal, that list of numbers, but I don't tell you the sample frequency, then you don't know anything about time. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to take out time out of this whole situation. Okay, so this is the definition that we define here. Okay, wonderful. How does this help me? Well, it helps me in the way that I can actually now, the cool thing is here I've got ft and I can just re replace that with f omega, this magical thing that we will explain in a second. Okay, so this f times t becomes f omega, this kind of normalized frequency. And that is what gives us the discrete time Fourier transform. What is this thing? That's just xn if I use my square bracket notation. So what I will do now is I will write out an equation that doesn't have time in it, okay? So x of f omega, this is the discrete time Fourier transform, is equal to the sum from minus infinity to infinity of xn times e minus j 2 pi n f omega, okay? There's no time in there, which is like should blow your mind a little bit. Sampling frequency have been removed. I can also write this in terms of angular frequency, um, which is, you, you remember, angular frequency is normally in radians per second. Now this is like discrete time uh, angular frequency. And it's pretty much the same equation, um, except that it actually gets a little bit simpler. It's just a, a different form for the same thing. E minus j omega, where omega is equal to 2 pi f omega. This is this like uh, discrete time angular frequency. What happened to the n in the exponent? Thank you. What do you think happened? I was an idiot, yes. Okay. I was an idiot. Sorry. Now, boom, this is the discrete time Fourier transform. Okay. Okay, so let's just quickly talk about this f omega thing that we just like pulled out of the air. 
Let's think about its units, okay? It's a little bit weird because f has units of hertz and fs also has units of hertz. So f omega is almost like this unitless thing. But we can get a little bit more insight by thinking about it like this. So the period is seconds per sample. Frequency, frequency it kind of has units, cycles per second or continuous cycles per second, right? It's how many ups and downs does a sinusoid have in one second? That's like if it's five hertz, it means there's five cycles in a second, okay? And then the sampling frequency here, that is like samples per second. So what is the units of F omega? Cycles, cycles per sample, that's exactly right. It's the number of continuous cycles from a signal that I get in one sample, per sample. The number of continuous cycles that I get in a single signal per sample. That's what F, F omega is. Okay, and this will, this will, we'll recap this again so that it really sink, sinks in. Um, just quickly, the, the units for um, omega here, that is, you can go through the same thing, it's radians per, not second, but per sample. Okay, and this whole thing is the discrete time Fourier transform. Okay. These things, both of these actually, are periodic. Okay, and that shouldn't surprise us. Um, but they have a periodicity. X F omega has a period of, it repeats every one cycle per sample. So you can actually go and prove that this thing is periodic. It goes, it basically repeats. And um, in terms of angular frequency, you can go and convince yourself that it repeats with a period of 2 pi. Okay, why do I say this is not, not that surprising? Because if I go back to this slide, I know that the discrete spectrum, and rem remember what we've done is just the discrete time Fourier transform, which is just the Fourier transform of this thing, essentially. I know it should repeat. Dunk, 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 dunk. I know it should repeat every fs, okay, and f omega is just fs over, uh, f over fs, so it should repeat every one time. Let me draw that out in a second. It's really like in terms of f, we have this Fourier transform and it's this thing that is, is periodic. It's there and then it has a little bump there and it has a little bump there. And these bumps are, this one is at fs, this one at 2fs and 3fs, this one is at minor fs, minus fs. What happens if I, instead of drawing this in terms of f, I draw this in terms of just the axis. I'm just changing the axis. The picture stays the same. But in terms of f omega, f omega is equal to f divided by fs. So if we're at fs here, where are we on f omega? What's the value of f omega at that point? 1. That makes sense. This is at minus 1. And at 2 and at 3 and at 4 and so on. So that's why I say the discrete time Fourier transform is periodic with a period of one. If we think about it in terms of a discrete time um, frequency, then it repeats at one and at two and at so on. And that's actually, just take a moment to pause there. That's actually super nice because now there's nothing about time anymore. This whole thing is just in terms of this kind of unitless cycles per sample thing called F omega. Okay, if my axis were, okay, and there's also one at zero. If my axis were in terms of omega, discrete time angular frequency, then I would have at zero and at two pi and at four pi, at minus two pi, at minus four pi and minus six pi. Okay, so those are just basically saying the same thing. Okay.